So good morning to those of you in Europe and Africa. Good afternoon and evening to those of you joining us from Asia and a very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining this, the 28th of our regular series of short courses on pumping topics. This one will last about 40 to 45 minutes, allowing us the time for a Q&A session at the, uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, we have 886 registrations for today's sessions, which is outstripping our previous record of 648. And so, as you can see, I've had to buy yet another new waistcoat and tie combo to celebrate it. There you go. Those of you who attended any of the earlier sessions will know that we are deliberately steering away from product presentations and towards educational content. We believe this is very important in the new world order of many engineers working from home, uh, making in workplace training that much more difficult. I do include a few slides at the end of the presentation to remind you of who we are and what we do, but I don't dwell on them. They'll be in the PDF copy of the presentation that you get so you can peruse them at your leisure. So here's a listing of all the previous short courses we've run during the last two years. If you've missed any of them, um, you can get a copy of the materials um, from our website. Use the following link, shortcourses.roarpumpen.com, or go to www.roarpumpen.com and follow the link to RP Short Courses. If you go to roarpumpen.com, you get to this screen. And here is the link to RP Short Courses. If you click on that, it takes you to this screen, which you can also access directly by typing in this link. You'll see all the courses um, listed, and you can click on any of them to see the course material. The most recent of the previous 27 courses are up there. Well, this seminar is going to look at NPSH, probably the most difficult and misunderstood concept in pumping. There's been an awful lot written on the subject, some of it really good. And if I whet your appetite sufficiently today, I've given some links and references at the end of the presentation for your future reading and viewing. The aim of this 45 minute session is to give you a basic understanding of NPSH, what it is and how it affects us. I'll also be explaining suction specific speed and particularly why there is a limit of 11,000. We'll hold a Q&A session at the end. Unfortunately, the nature of a Zoom format for these seminars makes a fully interactive Q&A impossible, especially with so many attendees. At the last count, there were over 160 attendees for this session alone, and we had over 200 attendees for all of the previous sessions. So it won't be fully interactive, but we'll do the best we can. Please use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions or make any comments. I'll address those that I can live at the end of the session, and the rest will address by mail in the coming days. We're recording this session and we'll make it available to all attendees as a YouTube link, as well as by emailing you a PDF version of the slideshow, complete with um, my commentary on that as well. So this is what we'll look at today. We'll look at NPSH available, then NPSH required, what it is, how we measure and test it. Then we'll move on to cavitation and we'll look at NPSH induced cavitation and suction and discharge recirculation induced cavitation. That's low flow, low flow cavitation. And finally, suction specific speed, what it is, and we'll talk about the 11,000 limitation. The first NPSH available. Well, this is what it is. At any given temperature, all liquids have a definite pressure at which they boil. Now, every day we witness the fact that a liquid boils at atmospheric pressure when it reaches a sufficiently high temperature. But it's important to remember that a liquid will boil at 
any temperature if the pressure is reduced sufficiently. So while at sea level, water boils at 100 degrees centigrade, at the top of Mount Everest, it boils at 68 degrees centigrade. And if we reduce the pressure even further, it could boil at 20 degrees centigrade. This is what we as pump engineers need to do. It's our job to make certain that there's enough pressure on the fluid being fed to the pump so that the liquid does not boil in the suction of the pump. Well, here's what the letters NPSHA stand for. And here is the definition of NPSHA, the net positive suction head available. It's the total suction head in feet or meters of liquid absolute determined at the suction flange minus the vapor pressure of the liquid in feet or meters absolute. Put another way, NPSHA equals the suction pressure minus the vapor pressure. And here it is expressed arithmetically. So NPSHA equals HA, which is the head from the absolute pressure acting on the surface of the liquid. Now, if it's an open suction system, an open tank, or maybe a submerged pit, then this will be atmospheric pressure. But in a closed system, a sealed tank, it will be the pressure in the suction vessel acting on the surface of the liquid. So that's the first term, HA. Then we have HVPA, which is the head from vapor pressure. Then we have HST, which is the static head either above or below the pump impeller center line. This value will be negative in the case of a suction lift. And the final term, HF, friction head in the pipework. So you calculate each of these, then you end up with the total system NPSHA. So that was NPSHA, here is NPSHR. Net positive suction head required. NPSHR is the total suction head in feet or meters of liquid absolute measured at the suction flange, center line of the impeller, that corresponds to a 3% reduction in discharge pressure. Sometimes 1%, we'll come to that later. For years, NPSH required was always NPSHR. More recently, they're defining it as NPSH3, which indicates a 3% reduction of pump discharge head to commence cavitation, or NPSH1, where, which is measured as a 1% reduction in head, indicating the onset of, uh, of uh, cavitation. We will cover this some more later. Don't worry about it too much. NPSHR is the same as NPSH3. Well, why does a pump need a positive suction head? This is a bit wordy, I'm afraid, but it's fundamental to understanding what NPSHR is. On all pumps, there is a pressure drop as the flow enters the pump. This is caused firstly by an increase in the velocity as you enter the pump. Now, this is where a pump expert will nod sagely and say, ah, yes, Bernoulli's theorem. And the rest of us will say, what? So I'm making this simple. Bernoulli says simply that an increase in velocity is associated with a decrease in pressure. Let me say that again. Bernoulli says that an increase in velocity is associated with a decrease in pressure. So as there's an increase in velocity as it goes into the suction, suction flange of the pump and the entrance of the impeller veins, so you get a drop in pressure at that point. We also have friction and turbulence between the suction flange and the entrance to the impeller veins. Now, it's impossible not to have this pressure drop 
Pump designers are seeking to minimize it in their designs and work on these areas. And system designers, you need to seek to ensure that the pump systems have a positive suction head sufficiently high to overcome this pressure drop within the pump and to keep the fluid from boiling at the pumping temperature. That's the key thing. We're looking to stop the fluid from boiling at the pumping temperature. Here it is, visually and graphically. You'll see here the pressure profile as the flow goes through the pump. Firstly, within the suction piping here at A, fluid friction gradually reduces the pressure in the suction piping. Here, B now at the suction flange, the liquid begins to accelerate into this tapered section, the suction nozzle. Now, as I said, Bernoulli's theory tells us that as the fluid accelerates, it reduces in pressure. So we get a further pressure drop here. Now at C, we're just entering the impeller. As it enters the impeller, the acceleration continues as the area gets slightly smaller at the impeller eye. So yet another pressure drop occurs within the pump. At D, here we are at the impeller vanes. As the liquid travels further into the impeller, it enters the passages between the impeller vanes. Now, these passages between the vanes reduce the area slightly more. And so again, we have an acceleration and associated pressure drop still further until we've got now to this point here, which is the lowest pressure area within the pump. And that's where we concentrate our designs as design engineers. Finally, now we, we've entered the impeller properly. The centrifugal force added by the impeller vanes throws the liquid out into the casing volute and to the pump discharge flange. And it's now generating pressure, generating head. Well, now we're going to look at how we measure and test for NPSHR. Here is a typical pump test loop. We have a storage tank kept at constant level. It might be sealed or it might be open to the atmosphere. Some systems might need a booster pump to give you additional pressure. You might have the flow meter here in the suction line or you may have it here in the discharge line, it doesn't matter. Here is the control valve for throttling the suction, the thermometer, um, the suction gauge, measuring, able to measure vacuum. Here's the pump. Here is the discharge pressure gauge that we'll be measuring the, uh, the outlet pressure with. Flow meter, discharge control valve, possibly a heat exchanger, and then back to the system again. When we're NPSHR testing, we need to reduce the suction pressure to the point at which boiling occurs. This product pressure reduction can be achieved in one of two ways. In suppression testing, a vacuum is pulled on the air gap at the top of the sealed tank. So we have a sealed tank in this instance and a vacuum pump. Pull a vacuum here, reduces the suction pressure to the pump measured on this gauge. The other way is by throttle suction. In this case, the suction pressure is reduced by gradually closing that valve, uh, reducing the suction pressure to the pump there. This is generally considered not the most um, accurate way, um, but both NPSH testing methods are acceptable to API 610 and to industry standards. So what are we going to do? 
we're going to take five or six flow rates, and while maintaining the flow rate, we'll reduce the suction pressure, either by pulling a vacuum or by throttling, all the time measuring the discharge pressure until we see a 3% drop in discharge pressure. That is considered to be the onset of cavitation. Then we'll reset for the next flow rate and we'll repeat. Here's a summary of what I just said. I'll leave it up on the screen for you to read while I give my voice a rest for a few seconds and have some water. Okay, I hope you've got that. So here we go. Six flow rates, 126 gallons a minute, 201, 253, 331 gallons a minute, 402, and 445 gallons a minute. Here on the x-axis is the suction pressure in feet, which is the NPSH available. And here on the y-axis is the discharge pressure, again measured in feet. So we gradually reduce the suction head, we, sorry, we, we set the flow to 126 gallons a minute, and then we slowly reduce the suction head, the NPSH available, while measuring the discharge head. Here are the points. And at some point we get a sudden fall off in the discharge pressure. When we've noted that, we repeat, reset, and repeat for the next flow. So we get 201 gallons a minute until it falls off the end. And we reset for 253 gallons a minute. So then we determine at what point the fall off in discharge pressure corresponds to a 3% drop for each flow. And then we plot the NPSH curve. Here it is. Here, 126 gallons a minute corresponds to a 10 foot in PSH available. So there. And here, if you look at the 201, it corresponds to about 11 feet. Eyeballing it, it's 11 feet. You do a proper calculation of all the figures until you get an accurate figure, 11 feet in this instance. And here, 402, it's about 14. 14 feet. And so that's your NPSH curve. Now I want to clear up a common misconception. People think that suction cavitation occurs when NPSH available is less than the NPSHR required. Well, this is wrong. It is not sufficient for NPSH A to merely equal NPSH 3. At the NPSH 3 point, you already have boiling and cavitation going on. To avoid any NPSH cavitation damage, you need to go to a much higher suction pressure. Now, for an average centrifugal pump to completely eliminate cavitation, you'd need to raise it to more than five times the NPSHR. Here we have an NPSH curve. Here we see the 3% head drop that we've just established in the previous slides. And it's for this particular pump, it's about 19 feet. Here is the 1% head drop NPSH point, 25 feet. It's about 30% higher. That's typical. Here is the 0% head drop. You're still getting bubbles formed, but they're not doing enough problem to reduce the, uh, the, the, the performance of the pump noticeably. So that's the 0% head drop. And as we can see, it's about three times the uh, NPSH 3%. And finally, here is the point at which um, 
bubbles start to form on the impeller at all, the cavitation inception point. And as we can see, 107 feet on this instance, which is five and a half times the MPSH3. Okay, the point I'm gonna make here is all pumps operate with suction cavitation. The only question is whether it's damaging cavitation. We don't expect you to be able to get five times the MPSH in all installations. That would be probably too expensive. You'd be raising the tanks too high or you'd be um, raising your suction pressures too high, your system pressures too high. There has to be some sensible margin. So now I want to move on to the cavitation damage. In the last few slides, I started to talk about cavitation. Here is what we're talking about. As the suction head value gets closer to the MPSH3 value, vapor bubbles form on the underside of the inlet veins of the impeller. Here, here. As these veins, they try again. As these bubbles are swept into higher pressure areas, they collapse with a shock. And here is the damage that shock causes. So that's what it looks like. What does it sound like? It sounds like a handful of gravel rattling around in your pump. Again, this is uh, a bit wordy. Um, but I'll read it through and take it slowly. When a cavitation vapor bubble collapses, the instantaneous pressure of this small, high energy shock wave is many thousands of PSI over an extremely small area. You get two progressive shock waves that impact the metal surface. The initial microjet formed when the top surface of the bubble starts to collapse. Immediately after this microjet, the whole surface of the bubble then collapses and returns to liquid form. Now, the lifespan of a cavitation bubble from formation to collapse is about two milliseconds. So it occurs very rapidly. And the more rapidly the surrounding liquid collides, the greater the energy of the damaging shockwave and microjet. Here it is visually. Here is the bubble. Here the top of the bubble is beginning to collapse. Here is the microjet. Here we see the microjet with the high pressure jet impacting on the impeller. And here it's collapsing completely. And here we have some ultra high speed laboratory photos showing you the process, millisecond by millisecond. Here, um, full bubble here, two, three, four, as it progresses, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Here we see the micro bubble and the final collapse. As we said a couple of slides ago, all pumps operate with suction cavitation. The only question is whether it's damaging cavitation. So let's try and establish that. The extent of the damage will depend on several factors, the size of the bubbles, the density of the fluid, and various thermodynamic effects, enthalpy and latent heat. And these combined effects comprise Thermal cavitation criteria B. Well, I can see your eyes glazing over from here, and so are mine. This course is called NPSH Made Simple. So simply and effectively put, what this thermal cavitation criteria B means is that cold water forms big bubbles, has a high density, so the damage done when the bubble collapses is high. Hydrocarbons form small bubbles. 
and have a lower density. So the damage done when the bubbles collapse is much less. So here in a little more detail, thermal cavitation criteria B, here are some values for various fluids. The higher the value, the more damaging. So cold, cold water, 253, compared with butane, 0 0.0202, well, cold water is 12,000 times more damaging than butane. And propane is lower still. Interestingly, hot water is significantly less damaging than cold water. So when we do an NPSH test, we're testing on cold water. It's far and away the worst possible case. Bearing this in mind as well, there's a strong case for a hydrocarbon correction factor. This is allowed by Hydraulics Institute. And in fact, this slide comes from Hydraulics Institute standard. It's no longer allowed by API. It went out in about the fifth or sixth edition. And of course, we're now in the 12th. But out of interest sake, because it's still a valid point, it should still apply. And there are some of us in the industry that think it is something that API 610 got wrong when they removed it and they should correct it. But this is how it works. So if we're pumping propane at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, we come in at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, move up till we get to the vapor pressure of propane, is here, follow the diagonal lines up here, and we read that the correction factor is about eight and a half feet. So if your water MPSHR, for example, is 30 feet, if you're pumping propane at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you could reduce the MPSHR by eight feet to about 22 feet. Similarly, if we're pumping butane, you get a reduction of about two feet. This chart is still in the current HI standard, so you can download it from there. So since we can no longer do that, we have to ask ourselves, what margin do we think we need to avoid cav damaging cavitation? Well, the Hydraulics Institute standard, paragraph 9.6.1, addresses the margin. It says for API pumps, a factor of 1.1 or separation of one meter MPSH R minus uh, MPSH A minus MPSH R. And for chemical process pumps, it says the suction specific speed. Come to that in a minute. If the suction specific speed is less than 11,000, factor of 1.1 or separation of 0.6 meters. And for higher suction specific speeds, factor of 1.2 or separation of one meter. Um, I've done it just here for um, API pumps and chemical process pumps. In fact, that this paragraph 961 covers many other pumps like boiler feed pumps and things as well. So just refer to 9.6.1. Now, there are two other types of cavitation you need to know about that are nothing whatever to do with NPSH cavitation, suction and discharge recirculation. They occur when pumps operate back on the curve from DEP. Suction recirculation is often confused with NPSH cavitation. It does look a bit like it. When you operate away from BEP, you will get recirculation vortices here in the suction and here in the discharge. These vortices result in low pressure areas where bubbles form and high pressure areas where they collapse. That suction recirculation damage occurs here, on the opposite side of the vein to NPSH damage. That's how you can tell the difference. But 
you need a dentist mirror to see it. Here on the top end of the, uh, this is NPSH cavitation damage. There. Suction recirculation is on the underside of that impeller, and you can only see it with a dentist mirror. So you can understand why people would confuse the two. Now, discharge recirculation occurs here with formation of the bubbles here and collapse here onto the uh, shroud of the impeller. So here we see it. I don't know if you can see it. There's a hole there. And there's a, another hole there. So now I can hear you screaming, which type have I got? How can I tell in the field? And it's remarkably easy. The quickest and easiest way is to throttle the discharge valve. This will reduce the flow. So the pump flow is reduced. If the rumbling and rattling sound reduces, maybe eliminated entirely, what's happening is we've moved back on the curve to areas of lower flow, which corresponds to lower NPSH required. So if it goes away, that tells you it was an NPSH problem. But if the rumbling and rattling sound and vibration increases, now you know you've reduced the flow, we've moved back on the curve to a lower flow area. That's where you get more and more suction and discharge recirculation. So it tells you it's going to get worse. And that tells you that it's a suction and discharge recirculation problem, not an NPSH problem. Third possibility, there's no change in the sound or vibration, which tells us unaffected by flow. So it's probable that it's air or gas entrainment in the liquid. Now, when you cannot increase the NPSH available sufficiently to solve a cavitation situation, you might need to consider selection of materials for the impeller to minimize the impact. Note how cast iron and bronze, which are the two most common impeller materials for water service, um, they're the least resistant to cavitation damage. So if you're pumping water with cast iron impellers or bronze impellers, you might want to make sure you've got a big margin between NPSHA and NPSHR. This is an interesting one. Note how CA6NM, 12% chrome steel, is a pretty resistant material. It's inexpensive and it's commonly supplied and stocked by pump manufacturers. That's the material that's usually used in uh, S6 construction pumps. Finally, we come to suction specific speed. You can think of this as a dimensionless number that describes the NPSH performance of an impeller. What you do is you take the full diameter performance curve of the pump and enter into this equation the speed, the flow at BEP, full diameter, and the NPSH at BEP, full diameter. That generates this number, the NSS. The lower the NPSH R value, at BEP, the higher will be the NSS. Okay, lower the NPSHR, the higher the NSS. Now, if you have an installation with low NPSH available, you'll need a pump with a high NSS, which means a low NPSHR impeller to be able to meet it. But most specifications limit the allowable value to 11,000 in US units or 12,760 in metric units. Why is this? Well, here's a history lesson for you. In the 1950s to the 1980s, impeller design methods available to pump designers were far more limited than they are today. 
Impeller designs from that era, era were notable for their achievement of good suction performance, low MPSH, through the deployment of large impeller inlet diameters. At that time, it wasn't understood that enlarging the impeller inlet diameter caused impairment of the impeller performance at flow rates lower than best efficiency point. This impairment exhibited itself as significantly increased vibration, suction recirculation, and sometimes an unstable MPSHR characteristic curve. In 1981, Warren Fraser published a paper which brought the consequences of relying on large impeller inlet diameters into focus. Now, POC users had already become increasingly concerned that while such designs minimized plant initial cost, it was at the price of reliability and overall life cycle cost. In 1982, Jerry Hallam published the results of a large scale reliability study carried out over a five year period at Amoco's Texas City refinery. He found that the reliability of a pump was meaningfully related to its suction specific speed. And specifically that pumps with a suction specific speed of it greater than 11,000 failed twice as often compared with lower suction specific speed pumps. And Hallam conclu concluded that this study indicates that caution should be exercised when purchasing hydrocarbon or small water pumps with a suction specific speed greater than 11,000 unless operation is closely controlled near best efficiency point. Now in truth, most refineries do not operate their pumps at best efficiency point. They operate them all over the curve. They have to be the refinery workhorse. I've heard it say in jest that the one place a process pump will never be asked to operate at in the field is its design point. So now Lobanoff and Ross, this is Bob Ross, who used to be the chief engineer at um, Flowserve's facility in San Jose, California. I had the honor of working with him. He's a very good engineer. But anyway, Lobanoff and Ross carried out testing in 1985, which supported this limitation based on the then current state of impeller design. It's an important point, based on the then current state of impeller design. They tested a range of impellers with differing suction specific speeds from 7,000 to 20,000. Now for each impeller, the flow was varied until the pump vibration level exceeded the API 610 allowable limit. Now this testing showed a strong correlation between suction specific speed and failures in the speed in the field. It justified what Hallam had found. The limit of 11,000 became widely adopted as a hard limit in the oil and gas industry. And it's still rare now to see a specification that doesn't invoke it. But impeller design has improved by leaps and bounds since the 1980s, and many authors have published papers to this effect. <clears throat> including our own Michael Hirschberger, the hydraulic design engineer in the Ruhrpump and Witten factory in Germany. Central to their claim was the premise that modern impeller design techniques allowed the attainment of lower NPSHR and hence higher suction specific speed values, but without relying solely on enlargement of the impeller eye. And remember, it was that enlargement of the impeller eye that was causing the suction recirculation damage. <clears throat> in 2013, Bradshaw, Cowan, and Liebner of ITT Goulds 
repeated the Loganoff and Ross study from 1985 using modern impeller designs and pump construction standards. And this is very important. Back in 1981, we were still using the sixth edition of API 610, and pump construction and design was much flimsier than in the seventh edition. That was a step change in pump design and construction, and it's continued through to the 12th edition, where we are now when it comes to ruggedness of the pump. Their study with modern design pumps would certainly suggest a limit of 13,000 rather than 11,000, and probably as high as 15,000. It's a very interesting read, and I'd recommend it to you. Here is a, a link to it, and I give it again at the end of the presentation. Now, this does not mean that all our designs now are with such a specific speed of 13,000 or more. We realize that 11,000 is entrenched in the industry psyche and embedded in pump specs for the foreseeable future. So most of our designs are with a such and specific speed of 11,000. But if you have an NPSH problem and an open mind, we may well have a 13,000 NSS impeller design that will help you. Right. Bringing us to the end here, I borrowed from several sources in preparing this short course, particularly from Simon Bradshaw and from Ian James. So credit where credit is due. I hope I've whetted your appetite and that you want to know more on the subject. So here are some links and references for you. Within these Simon Bradshaw links here, you'll find links to films of actual cavitation, which is particularly interesting. Well, that pretty much concludes the fun for today. I just get to advertise the next of the short courses. The impact of curve shape, head rise to shut off, and zero tolerances on equipment selection, reliability, and pricing. You know, it's amazing how many process and rotating equipment engineers just assume that every pump will have a head rise to shut off of 10 to 15 percent and they design their plants accordingly. I'm going to show you how this wrong assumption can lead to oversizing of equipment and subsequent poor performance in the field. It's going to be on the 12th of January after Christmas, so six weeks today. Again, two sessions, one for the Eastern Hemisphere, that's you guys and one for the Western Hemisphere. The invitation will be published nearer the time, so put it in your diary. Okay, I'm leaving the meeting open for a little while to allow you to post in the Q&A box, and I'll endeavor to uh, answer those that only need a short answer here and now live. Those that need a fuller answer will be answered within a few days. Anything you think of later, marketing, at rawpumpin.com or to me directly s smith at rawpumpin.com our marketing team will send you in the next few, couple of days the uh well early next week the youtube recording and the pdf of the presentation if you need a certificate of completion for this short course again info at short, uh, marketing at rawpumpin.com and here, right at the end, as usual, eight slides about Raw Pumpin that remind you of who we are and what we do. They'll be in the PDF copy of the presentation so you can view them at your leisure. So now, on with the Q&A. Let me stop the share. And let's have a look and see what we have in the Q&A. OK, let's see what we've got. We have an anonymous attendee. Will you share the records afterwards? Yes, everyone who has attended this uh, course will get the um, a, a, a link to the YouTube video of this one so you can see watch it again. And you'll also get a, a PDF copy of the slideshow complete with all my speakers' notes.
Damesh Kumar Panchal says, can we use affinity laws, which is used for head to estimate the NPSHR at maximum diameter or different speed NPSHR um, estimation? Um, no, the very loosely, the, the affinity laws can apply. So you can, for example, um, change if you have a different speed of pump. So you're, um, you're running the pump at um, two pole 60 cycle instead of two pole 50 cycle, uh, then um, you could try to use the, uh, the affinity laws, but it doesn't really work particularly well. I would say, get yourself a, 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 a proper curve from the manufacturer. Um, as I recall, when you reduce speed, you could use the affinity laws to do it, but when you speed it up, it's a much higher factor um, than, than, the, than, the, than the square law that you would expect. Um, again, I would um, you say, can we use the affinity law to estimate the max diameter or different speed, yeah, for the maximum diameter. Again, that's the, an NPSH curve is based on the maximum diameter. When you trim an impeller, the NPSH performance doesn't change um, because you're adjusting the outlet um, geometry of the impeller, not the inlet uh, in, uh, geometry. And it's the inlet geometry that determines the NPSH. Damesh Kumar Panchal says, some of the client specifications asked for NPSH ratio to be maintained above a, above a specified value. What's the significance of NPSH ratio compared with NPSH margin? It's just two different ways of looking at the same thing. But what we're looking for is to keep a nice, healthy margin above the NPSHR. And the more damaging the, the fluid, so water is the worst possible case, you want a, a high margin. Now, whether you express that as a factor or as um, a, a number of meters of, of safety margin, that's that, that, that's up to you. The effect is the same. What we want is to keep a big separation, especially with water, much more forgiving on hydrocarbons, particularly light hydrocarbons, methane, propane, butane. They uh, are very forgiving. They form small bubbles. Uh, they are low, low specific gravity. So when the bubble collapses, it's a small shock, as opposed to with water, where it's a big shock. Victor says, could you please advise if trimming, reducing the outer diameter of the impeller, will affect its NPSHR cavitation characteristics and why? I think I just answered that. No, it doesn't, because when you trim an impeller, you're affecting the um, the outlet geometry of the impeller, not the inlet geometry, and it's the inlet geometry that affects the NPSHR. Jeroen Boller says, sometimes pump vendors supply the pump with an eccentric reducer. Is this additional pressure drop corrected for in the predicted NPSH curves? I'm wondering if you mean an inducer, an inducer on the suction. Um, yeah, that would reduce the NPSH required uh, if uh, you have an inducer fitted to the pump. And you would have a separate curve for that inducer. So you might have a curve for the pump that doesn't have a, uh, an inducer and a separate curve for one that has an inducer. The anonymous attendee says, do we need to apply viscosity correction factor on NPSHR value while calculating the NPSH margin? My initial thought is that you don't need to apply the viscosity correction factor, but I need to think about this a little more and I'll give um, an answer in writing on this particular point. Jerome Boller says, what is the effect on cavitation if there's a lot of salts in the water with a density around 1,200 1, kilograms per cubic meter? Um, the density is very high, 1.2. So therefore, the you've got damaging cavitation. If you have cavitation, it's going to be even more violent than for, with fresh water. 
with a, if you've got an SG of 1.2, that much more uh, damage will be caused. Opiluwa Gordon, excuse me if I pronounced that wrong. How does all these scenarios, recirculation, NPSH recirculation, relate to pump thrust loads? Um, they don't directly, um, as far as I can think. No, they, they, they would, there's no reason why they would impact the, the thrust loads. All you would be talking about as you move away from the best efficiency point, um, thrust loads would be higher. Hafik Shah says, can you please explain the procedure for a vertical suspended pump in PSH test? Yes, good question. Thank you for that. Um, some vendors, uh, Rural Pump in, in particular, we would have a, um, a suppression tank in which we can fit the vertical, uh, the vertical suspended pump in there. And so we can pull a vacuum on it and test for the um, for cavitation, the onset of cavitation in the normal way. Other vendors, pump manufacturers, will test their VS6 pumps in the actual suction can. So again, you can then pull a vacuum on the suction and do a proper NPSH test. Others do a performance test of a um, VS6 pump in an open pit. Well, under those circumstances, if you're doing that, you, you, you can't um, pull a suction on it and you can't do um, nozzle um, suction throttling. So what you have to do then is lower the level in that pit until you uh, simulate it. It's not a proper NPSH test. It's far better if you can either test the pump in its suction can or um, if you can uh, um, put the pump actually in the suppression tank. Of course, if you're testing a VS1 pump, an open sump configuration pump, testing it in the um, in the open pit and lowering the value until you start to get um, cavitation, that's a very valid way of doing it for a VS1 pump because it's simulating the actual way that pump will be operating in the field. Mohammed Ibrahim says NPSHR stated in the pump curve is absolute pressure. However, the NPSHR identified by measuring the inlet pressure of the tested pump with pressure gauges. Uh, yes, you have to compensate. You'll be measuring a gauge pressure when you do the, um, the, the when you take the readings on, uh, on the test stand. So you need to compensate for the fact for local atmospheric pressure. Quite right. Jerome Boller says, why is suction specific speed based on the maximum impeller diameter, while at the same time it's concerning the impeller inlet? Well, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. Thank you. Um, we're looking at the design condition of the pump, the way the, the designers wanted it to be working. And that's at full diameter and at best efficiency point, best efficiency point for that full diameter. We look, they're looking at the NPSH figure that corresponds to that flow, best efficiency point. So yes, the full diameter, we're looking at the design, the ideal design of that impeller. <clears throat> Mohammed Ibrahim says, the liquid entering the pump of the suction nozzle is actually rotated with the impeller speed. Is there any effect on NPSHR values? So this rotated liquid should be minimized or directed by inline gauge ve guide vanes to enhance the entrance losses to the impeller. Yes, good point, Mohammed. That's exactly what our hydraulic engineers are trying to do, to minimize the losses as the flow goes into the impeller. And so we look at all sorts of, um, of, of things and we use computer modeling, um, <clears throat> as well as windows in the pump to have a look and see what is actually happening to get absolutely optimal flow through the pump with minimum losses. <clears throat> 
Mr. O here says, any correlation between the MPSH test and the submergence test? Um, yes, they're very similar. You're taking down the level in the suction tank. So you're, 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 if you're doing a submergence test on a vertically suspended pump, you're lowering the level in the, in the tank, which is lowering the, what you would be getting in the field. You're reducing the suction pressure until the point where you get habitation forming. So yes, it, it, it is directly comparable. Bonnie Saikia says, in case our equipment is a low flow, high head equipment, do you recommend a centrifugal pump considering the cavitation problem? Um, okay, a low flow, high head. If you're talking about a high speed pump, like uh, a Sundine pump, a Sunstrand pump, um, they invariably are fitted with inducers to improve their, um, uh, their NPSH performance. They do have quite a high NPSH requirement. So you are going to have to need um, plenty of NPSH available. What you can use instead of a Sundine pump, a high speed pump, you can use a multi-stage VS6 pump, for example, which would get you around the NPSH problem, but it will be a big, a long pump with 20 or 30 stages. Um, to, to achieve the same thing that will give the uh, uh, same performance that will be achieved with a, a high speed pump. Hassan Khan says, would you recommend NPSHR prediction using CFD simulation during design stages? Yes, that's exactly what we do. Um, that and many other uh, techniques as well. This is how we've been able to move things on from the 1950s to 1980s when the only way to get a low NPS8 pump was to make a big eye pump. We've moved on a long way since then. Mustafa Abu Zaid says, when choosing a new pump, should we calculate the RPM from the equation of NSS to avoid cavitation? It is worth your while to, well, what you need to do is to calculate what your NPSH available is and then look at the marketplace and see um, what, what, it, what is available out there. If you've given yourself three meters of NPSH available, you need to look and see if there are pumps that will give you two meters of NPSH required. In this particular instance, you'd probably be talking about a VS6 pump, a, a zero NPSH pump. But uh, yeah, that, that's what I would do, uh, uh, look at the marketplace. Speak to, speak to some sub vendors and then consider whether you need to increase your NPSH available. Amir Hasnain says, need a bit more details about cavitation due to entrapped air or gas in fluid. Um, okay, I'll see what I can dig out on that and, and, and get it to you, Amir. Lele Oludare says, thank you. Can you send here a live demo, a life demo or some sort of animation of these bubble collapse induced collapse? Um, in the, um, the references I gave in the last slide, there were some uh, re um, references to Simon Bradshaw papers. Within those, there are links which show the um, actual formation and collapse of uh, uh, of um, cavitation bubbles actually it, during a performance test. So uh, take, a, take a look at those. I think that will be very, very valuable for you. Anonymous attendee says, would you consider a more conservative NPSH a margin for VS type pumps? Um, no. Um, no reason, I, I, I would keep it the same. All I would say, perhaps, yes, I've changed my mind. I, I would I would be more liberal, not more conservative with the uh, margin because if you're using a VS type pump, you're probably pumping propane or butane, possibly methane, light hydrocarbons. Light hydrocarbons um, have, have a low density, they small, form very small bubbles and the shock when they collapse is small. So 
you can actually reduce your NPSH margin. Hassan Khan says, kindly recommend literature that discusses impeller inlet design to minimize recirculation based NPSHR and also NPSH3. There's a lot of work out there. I gave three or four references in, uh, uh, in the last slide that I put up, up there. Um, yeah, have, have a look at those first and they will have, within them, they will have um, references as, as, as for other links. George Paradisus says, why is the use of an inducer not allowed in many specifications for improving the NPSH margin? This is really, it's another historic one. Um, in the olden days, inducers would reduce the NPSH required of a pump at a specific point, but they tended to be very specific. The NPSH curve, was U-shaped like this. So as soon as you moved away from that design point, the NPSH uh, would be worse than if you didn't have the inducer at all. That's no longer the case. Um, inducer designs are now much, much better. And most of them have a, a pretty much a flat curve across a wide range. So yes, it's okay to consider inducers these days, in my opinion. Anonymous attendee says, what rule is used to determine the trimming diameter if affinity laws are not useful? No, the affinity laws work perfectly well for trimming diameter. They don't work well for predicting NPSH. Amar Abdul Karim Sadiq says, please, the range value between NPSH A and NPSH R according to API 610, is that one meter? Um, yes, one meter generally. Prabhin Raj, Raj says, even though VS6 pump can length is sized to have enough NPSH margin at the first stage impeller, why the NPSH test cannot be done in a VS6 pump at test bed when NPSHR suction flange is less than two meters? It can be. It, um, it rather depends on the pump supplier. Some will be able to do an NPSH, uh, a full performance test of a VS6 pump actually in its um, suction can, in which case you just pull a vacuum on it or you suction throttling exactly as you would do with a horizontal pump. Not all pump manufacturers can do that. Um, at Ruhr Pumpen, we will take the first stage impeller and put it in our suppression, in our, um, suppression tank, vacuum suppression tank, seal tank, we can lower it in through the top, seal it in place, pull a vacuum on that first stage impeller, and uh, so we, you're getting a genuine NPSH test. But not all vendors can do that. Some vendors then have to have to do a performance test in a open sump. You can't pull a vacuum on it. You can't put throttling on it. The only way you can do it is to lower the um, the level until you get cavitation. Mikhail Chipade says, how will the NSS be affected with respect to high flow rate pumps and with respect to the type of impeller? Yeah, the, um, the suction specific speed, the NSS of a pump is specific to that particular pump size and impeller. So if it's a big pump, you'll have a different number from if you have it on a, on a small pump. You have to look at it on each individual pump. Sabaji does says, why is it that NPSH cavitation forms underside of the vein and not on the other side? That's, I can't answer that. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, maybe answer it with a bit more uh, with a bit more thought or or reading. Um, it's coming to me, but I, I, I'll I'll answer it in writing. Chandra Verma says, how is NPSH A measured or assessed for zero cavitation? Well, the, very difficult to measure. 
um, you would need, in fact, you, you, it's got to be theoretical, I'm afraid, and you, you could actually see if you had um, a window into the pump, into the pump suction um, to do it. So you can do it on a um, in a laboratory situation. Um, you could have, for example, if it were an OH2 pump, which is normally for end suction top discharge, if you had a top this suction um, top discharge version of it, and if you had a window put in, you could actually see into the um, eye of the impeller and see when, um, um, at what point uh, cavitation bubbles form. Mikolaj uh, Yuskoviak, Yuskoviak, yeah, M Mikolaj Yuskoviak, is that the, maybe. What would be some golden rules for designing systems to avoid cavitation and possibly achieving best possible efficiency? Well, as a pump vendor, what I want you, pump, you um, customers to do is raise all your suction vessels high enough so that I've got plenty of NPSH available. Um, or raise the pressure in your system so that I've got plenty of NPSH available. I know that that can't be done, um, and so it's a compromise. I tell you what my best possible NPSH required is, and you adjust, tell me what your best possible NPSH available is, and we look and see if what we can do. Maybe you have to take a pump with a slightly higher suction specific speed, a 13,000 suction specific speed, a modern design of, of, of pump. Maybe you have to switch and say, oh, well, I can't, I can't raise my vessels any higher. I can't raise my liquid levels any higher. I can't raise the suction pressure any higher. So I'll have to go for a, um, a VS6 type pump, a submerged suction pump. Richard Obiobu says, thanks for that presentation. Please, I'd really appreciate you send me the presentation slides. Yes, you will get them next week. Mm. Mamani uh, El Badri, can you explain the effect of increasing the temperature of the pumping fluid on cavitation? Well, the vapor pressure goes up. Um, so the, the, hotter the, the hotter the fluid, um, the less NPSH available you have. Anonymous attendee says, I believe NBSH has the effect on the trimming diameter. If not trimmed correctly, it will generate discharge recirculation back to suction. Spot on, it will indeed. A badly trimmed impeller will generate discharge recirculation. Now, that's not NPSH though. It's sub discharge recirculation and it's nothing to do with NPSH. Narasimhan Krishnaswamy, my apologies as usual. How does the pump operating on variable speed drive affect the NPSHR? Um, yes, it does. Uh, if you speed up a pump, the NPSH required will go up. If you slow the pump down, it will reduce. But you can't use the affinity laws for it. You need to speak to the um, to, to the pump vendor, and they would uh, um, tell you for that particular pump. Uh, how, how to do it. Um, generally, if you slow a pump down, you can follow the affinity laws. So the NPSH will move by the square of the um, uh, of the speed difference. Um, but when you speed up, the NPSH doesn't move by the square of the, um, the square of the speed difference. You can use that as a first guess, but actually the NPSH will be higher than that. Damesh Kumar Panchal says, there are cases where NPSHR reduces as flow increases. Is this because of suction against discharge circulation envisaged? Yeah, NPSHR reduces as flow increases. I'm trying to remember if I've ever seen a pump where the NPSHR reduces as flow increases. I've always seen an NPSH curve going up like that. As the flow increases, the NPSHR uh, increases. I don't think I've ever seen it go the other way. 
Hassan Khan says, would you recommend NPSH prediction using CFD during design stages? I think I answered that. Yes, yes, definitely. That's exactly what we do. Nico van Duvendijk says, would a minimum flow circulation line back to the suction line increase the NPSH A? When you put in a minimum flow recirculation line, it shouldn't go back to the suction of the pump. It should go all the way back to the suction vessel uh, or well away from the pump. So in that sense, it doesn't make any difference. Mohammed Wakas Wain says, the minimum flow rate for a pump is related to reducing the cavitation arising due to recirculation at low flow within the pump. How to calculate the minimum flow rate to avoid this condition? Well, the way we normally as vendors determine the uh, minimum flow rate is as the pump goes back towards minimum flow, the vibrations will start to rise. And what we tend to consider the minimum continuous flow to be the point at which we exceed or meet exactly the API 610 vibration limits. So it kind of the, 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 the vibration that's being caused as you go back is in part down to suction recirculation that's um, occurring within the pump. So that's a, a, a good way of doing it. Uh, Aaron Raj Murlitharan says, as you said, trimming the impeller will not have any impact on the MPSHR. But is there any other way that we could vary the NPSHR in a horizontal pump, especially a multi-stage pump? Um, we can change the NPSHR by changing the impellers or by fitting it to, to a one with a higher spe suction specific speed or fitting an inducer. They, they, these will vary the NPSHR. Um, we don't usually have an, an inducer in a multi-stage pump, but um, most pump vendors have several designs of impellers that will fit in a multi-stage pump. Um, and so it could well be that that, um, uh, that they'd have a, a different design with a lower MPSHR. Hiro Zimin says, Simon, thank you for the presentation. As always, very informative. Thank you very much. Please advise if in the case of a closed system, tank, the vessel pressure equals to vapor pressure, i.e. means NPSHA is based on actual level of liquid only. Now, if it's a sealed tank, um, then it's not the level that's um, determining. It, it is, in fact, the pressure above that. Uh, so it might start at atmospheric pressure when you start, but then you'll turn on your vacuum pump, you'll pull a vacuum, and so then your your um, the level is not not important it, it doesn't come into it it's the pressure above it that uh, affects it anonymous attendee why would you consider npsh1 instead of npsh3 i presume that you have different rules of thumb for either but they'll give a similar result yeah if you have npsh1 it'll be a higher value of the um of of, of npsh during the performance test. And so you will need, as a customer, you'll need to supply more NPSH available if you're going to specify an NPSH one. Um, Aramco specifies uh, an NPSH one figure um, to be very conservative. It just means they have to raise the pressures or raise the elevations of their suction tanks uh, in each case um, to provide sufficient margin. Um, Asma Mohammed says, if we use two lower capacity pumps in parallel, the cavitation will decrease. Can't say. Um, it, <laughs> it's, it's possible. You, by having two smaller pumps, each of those pumps might have a, a, a lower NPSHR um, than one big pump. But, it might be the case or it might not. Uh, I don't, I'd have to look at the actual case in, in mind. 
Pele Oludare says, is NPSHR for vertically suspended pumps different from horizontal transform pumps? Um, no, really, it's the same. But as I mentioned a couple of times already, the, the way you test for it might be uh, might be different depending on your test capabilities. Nico van Duvendijk says, for the animation or video regarding cavitation and bubble collapse, you could look at this video around 30 Ah, thank you very much. I will take this link that you've given me, Nico, and I will put it into the uh, the, the answers for other people to, to con consider. Super G Daz says, why is is it why is it that MPSH cavitation forms on the underside of the vein and not the other side? Sorry, I'll, I'll I will um, give you a better answer on that. Damesh Kumar Panchal says, a question from Nimesh Shah. Please advise points to be taken care of for NPSH point of view for parallel operation and series operation. I'll think about it a little more, but I, I don't think there's any, you, you just need to make sure that the NPSH available exceeds by a safety margin the MPSHR, and that applies uh, certainly to parallel uh, operation. Series operation is only the first pump that has, has possibly got an MPSH problem. The second pump will have plenty of uh, MPSH. I mean, Panchal says, generally the minimum continuous flow increases with the increase in suction specific speed. How is it so? I need to think about that. I, I'm not sure that that's right necessarily. I'll think about it and uh, uh, um, it could be that, yeah. I don't think it should. I'll say the question again was generally minimum continuous standard flow, stable flow, increases with the increase in suction specific speed. I'm not sure that that is necessarily the case. Every pump is different. Every pump has its own minimum continuous um, stable flow. And we establish that by the vibration level of the pump. Damesh Kumar Panchal says, sir, please advise points to be taken care of from NPSH point of view. Oh, okay, sorry. It was a repeated question, sorry. Fatima Rahman says, how do companies determine the NPSHR in a pump test? That's exactly what we do in doing a pump test. We um, reduce the, um, the suction pressure until the pump cavitates, and that tells us what is the NPSH required. Damesh Kumar Panchal says, do you think a vertical suspended pump requires an NPSH analysis or just submergence analysis is, is enough? Well, I would say normally a submergence analysis would probably be uh, enough. It depends again, what are the margins? What is your NPSH available? What is the predicted NPSHR? If it's close, you probably want a proper NPSH test. If you've got lots of margin, and you often would have on a VS pump, you can just put in extra one meter lengths of column pipe and shaft to push the impeller down low enough that MPSH is never an issue, in which case you don't need an MPSH test. Javier Valerdi says, thanks for the presentation, Simon. I have a question, but it is more related to the vibrations. In heavy duty pumps, it's common to manufacture and test the pump side and the motor drive on separate workshops. Is it possible to ensure that the natural frequency will not be achieved, causing not desired vibrations? Um, yes, it is possible. Um, normally, normally you cannot test the pump on its on its base plate, grouted down. <laughs> and 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 have a, a a proper test string test of the whole of the whole thing. Um, sometimes if it's not a grouted base plate but a heavy duty um, non grout base plate, you could 
but, but again, the piping system doesn't simulate the piping system you're going to get in the field. So there's there's always a risk that you're going to get a natural frequency induced um, vibration. Um, and this can normally be solved in the field. You know, you'll get the pump supervisor out there and you'll look at changes to the, um, the pump foundation, um, changes to the piping system until you get, you get away from that uh, natural resonant frequency. Not a very good answer, I'm afraid, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a suck it and see situation. Ruslan Sagitov says, how to provide NPSH test on all flow points using suction throttle valve? When throttling the pressure, flow reduces too. Very good, thank you, Ruslan. Um, as you throttle the suction, you will reduce the flow. So you need to increase the flow again. So to do that, you open the discharge valve slightly and you'll, you'll adjust them both until you've got the flow back to constant flow. But that, that's why using suction suppression is better, um, pulling the vacuum on the uh, suction. Nikolai Yuskov Yuskoviak says, um, what is the correlation between impeller RPM and cavitation? Um, well, the faster you, you're running, the higher your NPSH requirement, and so cavitation damage will be greater. Mm. Or you need to keep a bigger margin, the higher the speed of the pump. Javier Valerdi says, related to the NPSH, how many, how many time, how much time will it take to a total failure of a pump with a problem of not enough NPSHA in a continuous operation? Can't say, depends what your pump, it'd be a different case every time. But if you hear that rattling, you've got an NPSH problem, you know you're causing damage to the pump, do something about it. Schedule a shutdown, check things out. Ruslan Sagitov says, will we expect any problem when the pump starts operation on open discharge valve when NPSHR is at the end of the curve is higher than the NPSHA? Um, generally not. It will very quickly come back down the curve to, um, to, to the, the actual operating pump. So you might get a, a few seconds of cavitation, um, but very quickly the pump will will, will find its proper operating point. Manakandan Surikama says, hi Simon, do we have a solution for low NPSH available such as 0.5 meter? Yes, it's a VS6 pump. Um, in a VS6 pump, the impeller can be lowered as far as needed. So instead of having an NPSH available of 0.5 meters, if you've lowered it by one meter, you've suddenly got an NPSH available of 1.5 meter. And if you lower it by another meter, you've got an NPSH available of 2.5 meters. So you you they are designed, VS6 pumps are designed as zero NPSH pumps. Zero NPSH available at the suction flange. Where the impeller is might be two or three meters down. Manikandan Surikama says whether suction specific speed reducing will it increase NPSH required? Um Yes, it will, by definition. The, the, a lower value of suction-specific speed means you've got a higher NPSHR. Well, that appears to be all the questions. I had 79 questions today. That's a, that's a record as well. <laughs> Very pleased with that. And I had over 200 people uh, actually attending today. So that also is, is, is very pleasing. Um, so it just relay, remains for me to say thank you for attending today. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I love these sessions, especially the Q&A sessions. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it too. Um, so the next course is on the 12th of January. I look forward to seeing you then. Um, thank you very much and bye-bye.